and we're live. Man, my comment section is blowing up with the whole Mario Murillo uh, post. And I just have to comment on it because, man, we got people all over the place. We've got, you know, Lance talks about lovers, warriors, and statesmen. And, you know, it makes me think about, like, how people handle conflict. It's like there's the lovers who are like, can't we just get along? Let's bring unity. Let's not be divisive. You know, then you've got, like, the statesmen, and the statesmen are like, hey, you know, both people have merit. Here are the reasons why I think that. And then the warriors, well, the warriors are kind of like me. The warriors are like, let's address this right now. Let, like Mario's a warrior, right? Let's address this. We have problems. We need to talk about it. What are we really saying? And so it's just interesting. You know, the body of Christ is really comprised of a couple different types of, um, we'll just call it like personality types. Um, you know, you see it with Barnabas, right? Barnabas and, and Paul. And like, even with Barnabas, where he's really like, like the relational guy. He wants everybody to get along. You know, he is um, really the first person, you know, everybody's scared of reporting. So anyways, Barnabas comes on the scene and he's like, you know, he's like, oh no, come on. He puts his arm around Paul. He brings him to the other brothers and they're all getting along. And he's like, hey, no, tell him these are all the things that happen to Paul. So he's like super relational. Ironically, the relational component of Barnabas is the thing that actually breaks up Paul and Barnabas because he wants to bring along, I believe it's John Mark wants to come along and Paul's like, no, he didn't travel with us the whole time. He's got to go. So Paul, more of the warrior type of person. So anyways, I just want to draw the illustrations that we're all different and God makes us that way for a reason because we have to be the body. But what I think is super interesting, you know, is that for me, me personally, I think it's important we start talking about these issues. We start talking about and leaders in the body of Christ really start doing this because what I think is coming for the body is really, for the body of Christ, is really what we just saw happen in the government mountain when Donald Trump came on the scene. Because by the time we were done and Donald Trump was out of office, we knew where every politician stood. We knew where every deep state organization stood. And there was like lines in the sand. And you knew, all right, we know where Mitch McConnell is. You know, we know where, uh, you know, who's our other guy that's kind of like uh, the rhino. Well, anyways, you know where all the rhinos are. So anyways, my point is, I think that's coming for the church right now. And the type of exposing that's about to happen in the church isn't going to be sexual sin of pastors or financial mismanagement. The exposure that's coming in the church is, are you a biblical Christian or not? Are you preaching biblical Christianity or are you not? And so, you know, there's a lot of things sometimes where it's like, can't we as Christians get along? And I think that what some of you might not be realizing is we're not talking about the same types of Christians. Just to say you're a Christian these days doesn't mean that we're believing the same things. Doesn't mean that you're believing what's in this book, okay? Because you might be rewriting what's in this book to match what your experience is. Your experiential theology is superseding the words that are written in the Bible. Because we have so many different Jesuses that are out there today, okay? We have the New Age Jesus, the hyper-spiritual Jesus, the just come as you are. He's going to love you the entire time. You don't have to change or repent or turn from sin. Like, he's just going to accept you. You want to live in that sexual relationship? Sure, keep doing that. You know, you want to, you want to, this is going to, listen, I know it's going to offend me. You want to get divorced a couple of times and get remarried? Sure, it's fine. But it's like, we can't allow we can't not call sin sin you know it's not the gospel it's not the good news if we're not being saved from something if we're not turning away from that those sinful things not like any of us do it perfectly i certainly don't do it perfectly but there is an act of turning away from those things and saying lord forgive me for that i don't want to do that give me the strength and the grace in order to live a holy life like what you call me to do and so this is what I'm saying. There's there's different types of Jesuses that are out there, which means there's different types of Christians that are out there. And so I think what's happening is there's lines being drawn in the sand. I think God's going to start. There's a couple of things that are coming. I think God's going to provoke leadership in the body of Christ to continue to point these things out and to say, this isn't congruent. We need to talk about this. What you're saying isn't lining up with the word of God. 
not only just in the profit side of the community, but also in the teaching side of the community, okay? There's also like these other Jesuses that are emerging like a political Jesus, which does kind of freak me out because I I like love my country. I'm super patriotic, you know? Um, but I'm a Christian first and I'm an ambassador for Christ first. And I don't want to ever look at like, Democrats or progressives or people like that as they or thems. I'm like, no, like that is another person. That is a person that's made in the image of God. And, you know, they're just doing what non-Christians would do. And so I want to minister to them and speak truth and love to those people. And so I don't ever want to become so jaded and think that there's some political Jesus that doesn't care about, you know, or love, um, you know, just even the most evil people out there. I mean, I was just reading today about Saul, right? Like Saul who converts to Paul, who approved of Stephen's death. The Bible says he approved of Stephen's death. And he, you know, basically held everybody's coats while they stoned him to death. And he imprisoned men and men and women Christians before the Lord intervened. And you know what? Like this is, I was thinking about this. This was kind of radical. You know, the goodness of God wasn't the thing that kind of kicked Paul in the butt uh, and converted him from, from Saul to Paul. It was Jesus saying, why are you persecuting me? And him being struck with blindness for him to have a aha. Oh my goodness. Jesus is real. So sometimes we throw these phrases around and it's like sometimes you need a little bit of a prophetic kick in the butt in order for you to kind of understand the fear of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the faithfulness of God, the identity of God. Sometimes, I mean, I know I, I need that from time to time. But my point is, I really am kind of concerned that, that I don't know if everybody's waking up to the fact that this what's coming for the church right now is like a chiropractic adjustment. It's a culture, culture is coming, culture's coming for church, and leaders can no longer be neutral. Leaders can no longer uh, just kind of sort of be involved in world issues. It's like that's coming for the church as well. And so I really think through a series of circumstances over the next couple of years, just like we saw with Trump's presidency and the government mountain of how lines were really drawn in the sand, that's what's about to happen in the church. And you see it like culturally, we saw it, right? We saw it with, um, I don't know if I want to say because I don't want this broadcast to get like, but when we all had to wear masks like two weeks to sl like slow the spread and that turned into two years and some churches never reopened again. And it's like, well, we got to submit to government. And then you think of great, you think about Paul and Silas and it's like, whether it's right to do what you're telling me to do or preach the gospel, we know we got to preach the gospel. And so like there's certain elements of, you know, resisting government authority when it, when it, conflicts with what God tells us to do, which is to preach and to heal the sick and to cleanse the lepers and things like that. And so, so we have that that's going on. And then also, you know, when we had, um, the Roe v. Wade situation, we've been one month, you guys, one month where Roe v. Wade has been overturned at a federal level. And like, we celebrate that. Yay. But not everybody is celebrating it. Not every church is celebrating it. And so that's a different type of Jesus right there. You're like, what? Like you can't, you can't celebrate the fact that Roe v. Wade, you can't even be bothered to say something at a Sunday service or post something, but yet you can post, you know, a black square or you can, you know, post things about BLM, but we can't celebrate the fact that Roe v. Wade was overturned on a Sunday morning. Like that doesn't make sense either, especially when, you know, I was reading Luke the other day. I mean, this will blow your mind. Go read Luke. John the Baptist um, is like the angel comes and tells Zachariah, you're going to have a baby and his name's going to be John and he's going to do all of these things. This is even before he's conceived. He's named and his destiny is foretold. Then the same thing happens to Mary, right? And so, so then Mary gets a visitation from the angel. You know, you're going to have a baby. He's going to, his name is Jesus and he does all this stuff. And then he says, and your, your relative Elizabeth is also pregnant. And so then it says, Mary made haste and Mary went to go see Elizabeth. So if you think about it, 
Oh, okay. And then, and then she walks in and then, and the Bible's good enough to tell you that Elizabeth is six months pregnant, which is kind of nuts, but we know that she's six months pregnant, which means when Mary gets to Elizabeth's house and she makes haste, like what in the old, like, like back then, 2000 years ago, was that a week? You know, is it three days? You're walking somewhere, you're taking a donkey somewhere. So she made haste. She gets there. Then she walks in and Elizabeth is like, wow, how blessed are you among women that the Lord of, you know, that the mother of my Lord would be in my house. And so you're, so you look at that and you're like, I mean, Jesus would have been, I mean, even if we said it took her a week or four weeks to get there. Okay. Jesus would have been first trimester in Mary's womb, abortable in many states, in many conservative states. And, you know, like when they're like, oh, it's a zygote. So Jesus would have been a zygote. And in, but in Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist leaps in her womb, is filled with the spirit, fills Elizabeth with the spirit. And she prophesies from that same place. The same mantle that the angel told Zechariah that would be on John comes upon him, even in the womb, because she's filled, he's filled in the womb. And again, six, probably six months old, maybe seven months old. So when we're talking about babies, destiny, individuals in the womb, that's what I don't get. I don't get like just reading that basic Christmas story, right? You cannot see that life in the womb begins before 12 weeks, before six weeks, and identity is and names are given, destinies are given, even before children are conceived in John the Baptist case. So anyways, just throwing that out there for free. So why we can't get up on a Sunday morning and celebrate the overturning of Roe v. Wade, I don't understand. But that's what I want to, that's what I want you to get, is that this is only going to become more and more prevalent. And the exposure that's coming in the church, because I've heard a lot of people say exposure's coming, exposure's coming. It is not going to be the stuff that I think we've seen in the past. I don't think it's going to be sexual sin or financial stuff. It is going to be whether you are preaching biblical Christianity or not. And I think people in the pews are about to wake up. I think they're going to be confronted. I think many of the people you're following right now, you're going to be confronted with of to say, you know, you know, listen, and there's a sliding scale, right? It's like trying to find a perfect church. You're never going to find a perfect church. You know, there's always going to be something wrong. It's the same way with these people, these like men and women of God that we all follow. It's the same exact thing. Nobody's ever going to be perfect. I'm not always going to be perfect to you. I'm going to say something. I'm going to make a joke. Your thing is inappropriate. But by and large, what we're really coming down to is, is, you know, these people that we're listening to, where are they? Where are they in all those different sliding scales? It's not just the prophetic community that's got questions around it. There's plenty of pastors in the pulpit that also have questions. You know, there's this political Jesus that's emerging that should also be a little concerning to us of like, wait a minute, is that lining up with what God's talking about? You know, so, so there's, there's, we really need to pay attention. I guess that's what I'm saying. I think that it's coming down to like the individuals. And you know, like I was reading, so I'm in Acts, I've been in Acts a lot, but so Simon the sorcerer, right, in Acts uh, 8. And so this is what it records about Simon the sorcerer. Um, it says, Now the man named Simon was previously in the city practicing sorcery and astonishing the nation of Samaria, saying he was someone great, to whom they all listened from the least to the greatest, saying, and this is what they said about him, This man is a great power of God. They listened to him because for a long time he had astonished them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Even Simon himself believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed as he watched the miracles and signs which were done. But I liked that line, this one line about what the people said. This man is the great power of God. And I just want to encourage you, please be careful because human nature is that. And I see it, you know, like there's another Bible verse where Paul's writing and he's talking about how some say I follow Cephas and some say I follow uh, Paul and some say I follow, you know, uh, Apollos, you know, and then Paul's like, I just think, I, he's like, I thank God I didn't baptize any of you. And then he's like, well, I did baptize these people and those people and these people. But human nature, my point is human nature is to find 
people and individuals that we kind of lift up and put on this pedestal and we say, this man is the great power of God, but no man is the great power of God. You and I and every person we watch and we listen to is a vessel, right? Like there's a, I think it's a verse in Corinthians that says we have this great power in jars of clay to know that this all surpassing power is from God and not from man. And so we cannot look to men and women as this amazing, uh, faultless power. I'll tell you, I work closely with one of them and I'm privy to a lot of other conversations at a leadership level. And these are normal humans. These are normal people. They put their pants on just like you. They go to the bathroom just like you. They have bad days just like you. They get frustrated just like you. And it's, it's just human nature. And so the all surpassing power is from God and we have got to be careful about putting people on pedestals and thinking they're not faultless and this whole thing of like oh she can't touch the lord's anointed don't touch the lord's anointed i have seen that so abused in so many churches i met larry in a church that abused that would preach that talking against the pastor is like talking against moses and you would be struck with leprosy i mean it is so abused in small churches some small churches like that and then even at a large level but we have to listen where I was with that is I said, cause I grew up Presbyterian and, and, and I ended up, you know, learning about the spirit in that church. I'm thankful for that. But Holy Spirit was, was given to all of us. Holy Spirit ministers to me and ministers to you and speaks to your spirit and testifies to your spirit. And so you're going to have that. If you open yourself up and listen, he will tell you what's right. He will tell you what's wrong, right? Like he's, um, you know, to, to train, to rebuke, to correct for righteousness sake, Holy Spirit was given to us. So I just want to encourage you just realize these are normal people. And I think this whole, I don't know how to say this, but I really feel like individual ministries, like um, like celebrity-driven Christianity, is aging out of the body of Christ. And I really think what's coming is team ministries. It's it's multiple individuals coming together, working together, much like it was in the book of Acts. They were sent out in teams and there was a plurality of leadership and there wasn't one single person that was higher than the other ones. And they sought wisdom together, right? There's wisdom in, uh, in, a, in a multitude of counsel. I feel like that's coming back. And I, I feel like it's couples. I feel like couples are coming together. I've seen a couple prototypes around the, the nation that where that's happening, where I see God drawing people together like that. And I really think what the, the purpose of it is going to be discipleship because, you know, a lot of people are asking for revival and praying for revival. And while I do too, I mean, guys, the church is anemic. By and large, our church is powerless. Um, I'm talking like huge churches, right? Like the the concept in the mega church, while well, does so much for the local community, I no, it's it's not always congruent with like what we see in Acts. And so I think that that's what's coming. I think I think that there's a discipleship movement that's coming before a huge outpouring is coming. Because why would God pour out? and get millions of people saved and then put them into powerless churches, churches that are not preaching the full word of God. And so I really, I think that there's an adjustment that's coming and I think it's going to be, um, it's going to be difficult for us to go through. And I think when we see it happen, you know, kind of like with this article that Mario wrote, I don't necessarily disagree with the things that he's pointing out in that but i do think that there's almost like a conversation that we need to have and i think people need to wake up i think we need to understand that it's time to start looking at that it's time to start looking at what people are saying and how does it line up with this and if you find yourself under teaching where it's not lining up underneath this we need to go find teaching or maybe we need to start becoming those apostolic prophetic 
hubs, you know, that I think are coming, that I think I see it. I mean, I know multiple people right now where God's talking to them about discipleship, 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 home groups, home groups, home groups. It's like, I see it happening a lot. Like I just, people talk to me about it a lot. And so I look at that and I, cause I like to see what God's doing. Like I almost feel like I can like privy to like, Ooh, look at the, Oh, look, he's moving these people there. And those people are doing that. Oh wow. Look at that. You know, like I get to kind of see the battle map a little bit. Um, and so I see discipleship coming and then I see a big move of God because he has to give the church a chiropractic adjustment the next couple of years. And the grassroots have really, I think, woken up to it. But I don't think at a leadership level, um, leadership and churches have woken up to this. And I think that that's what's coming. And it's going to be a little of a bumpy road. But we'll know at the end of like three or four years, maybe even a faster work, maybe the end of two years, you're going to know where everybody stands. So please be in prayer. Please be thinking about these things. Please try not to be easily offended and really listen to what's being said, you know, and read the Bible. And if you don't, you know, some sometimes I it's hard for me to like sit down and read, read the Bible. Um, what I really like to do is I have this app. It's called Bible.is. And like, this isn't a promo or anything like that. It's just what I use. I listen to it when I'm in the car, when I'm driving places and I just play it. And then uh, something will trigger and I'll be like, Ooh, I want to read that later. I want to dive deeper into that later. So I would suggest that too. Like if you're like me and it's like, Oh man, carving that time out or what's cool too, is you could put it on you like clean your house or whatever you're doing. Um, and just kind of listen to it. I really enjoy that. So, uh, I would encourage you to get that. It's bible.is. Um, and you can listen along too. So anyways, guys, I just want to get on and talk about it. Cause like I said, I saw so many comments going around. Um, and I, I just, I just kind of want to like raise your awareness a little bit more that I think more of this is coming and we need to figure out how to have a conversation about it. Unfortunately, I don't know if we can have like a council of Nicaea like they did back in the day when they were, you know, debating like the divinity of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus. Like it's hard to do that now because we're so like splintered in all of our denominations. But I know God's heart is unity, but we have to be mindful of what are we unifying with? That's kind of my overall point is that we can't just say anymore, oh, well, this person's a Christian. Well, what type of Christian? What Christian are we talking about? So that's, anyways, maybe we should have like a code word. Anyways, I'm just rambling now. But love you all. Hope you have a wonderful day. I am off uh, to do some work now. So I'll talk to you later. Bye, guys.